I'm going to move the podium away from here. Fun public speaking segment which serves as a barrier between you and the audience. If you want to engage in a more participatory way, move the barrier aside, and there's now nothing blocking me and you. Fun tip, you can write that down later if you want. Yoni Coleman's enjoyed himself way too much in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope to continue enjoying myself. Uh, so far, so that. <laughs> So the other thing that we're going to do is I'm going to ask for a lot of your participation, a lot of your role play. I might ask you to do some uncomfortable things, uh, partially for my own amusement, kind of because I can. And that's one of the benefits of being in the front of the room. But mostly because I think it can be a useful exercise to really put us in the minds of the teams that we're working with and to figure out um, tips and tricks and strategies for how best to engage with teams and maximize the role as advisors. So, the first thing that I'm going to ask you to do, and I warned you in advance, this was going to be uncomfortable. Uh, see that all these faces are priceless. This is how I know you're engaged. But don't worry, you're just going to have to keep it in your head, and you're only going to have to share if you want to. But it's still, it's for some people, going to be uncomfortable. I want you to go back in time, in your minds, and think back to when you were in high school and when you were a teenager. <laughs> And just like, again, if you're still there, maturity-wise, we can have that conversation afterwards. But I want you to go back in your mind a little bit and think back to when you were in high school. Perhaps freshman year, that transition between eighth grade, grade eight and grade nine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Translating from American to Canadian is sometimes very difficult. So it could be that transition. Um, Perhaps it was applying to university in grade 12. But to think back to that time when you were in high school. And for anyone who's comfortable sharing, and again, nobody has to, just what words come to mind to describe your high school experience? Please, no stories, no therapy, this is not business. A candle will not be going around for people to share their greatest, their greatest traumas. But like, what words come to mind to describe like, how you felt in high school? Okay, we got detention. Awkward. Awkward. What else do we have? Girls. Girls. Sports. Yes. Sports. It's fascinating to see the guy girls like that. Girls. Sports. Detention. <laughs> Frankly, I expected that from this side. Awkward. What other What other words do we have? Uncool. Uncool. Man after my own heart. Fun. Cool. Cleeks. That's a good one. Involved. Or clicks. Clicks or cleeks. That could be a, another word to say. <laughs> I'm saying trying really hard. Like, try to do specific things really, really hard, and like, you just need to focus that much energy on it. I'm not going to ask for examples, but I, all, like, I got it. I, we can all like substitute our own fill in the blank there. I feel like this is very healthy psychological magic. Like, I tried too hard at X, but instead I should have done Y. Which is like story of my life. Like, okay, so now we're gonna shut down the therapy for, for a moment. Um, thank God. Dr. Westerich will be here tomorrow. This is actually a giant chill for him. He's gonna give out business cards. It's gonna be great. We can work through all of this together. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're involved in NCSY to fix something in your high school experience. No, don't, no, no. For wrong reason to be involved, with people, but I appreciate the honesty that we're establishing. Okay, so now that we've all gone back into our own teenage experience a little bit, and for some perhaps too much, again, we got awkward, we got sports, we got cool, we got detention, we got trying too hard, and as Zell mentioned earlier, it's really that moment of transition. And specifically, um, psychologically, what's going on is what they call um, role confusion and identity formation. Because what happens in that transition in adolescence is that switch from Basically, as all good Jewish children know, I'm a mama and dad's boy, like over here, they define me. I am whatever they say that I am because I can't make any of my own choices yet. So I'm like over here. And then as I'm into adolescence, into the high school years, I'm starting to define for myself who I am. Problem being, I don't actually have the tools to do that. I don't actually know how to do that. And as a result, we end up in the land of awkward. Other problem. I'm no longer defining myself by my parents because Lord knows I don't want to be with them because I'm not that anymore, that being a child. So anything that I was doing beforehand is by definition childish and I'm not that. But I don't have anything to be yet. Oh look, all my friends are doing the exact same things. We're going to figure this out together. 
And that's what's called a recipe for disaster. Because nobody knows what they're doing. But we all don't know what we're doing together as we figure this out. And that's all of a sudden where all this influence of the peer group comes into play. Uh, Okay, I want to be accepted by them. I'm defining myself by them because I don't have a real way to define myself yet. And as a result, you end up in this very awkward and sensitive stage. Conveniently enough, in this wonderful handout that, as Yoni noted, we have sources on the bottom, adapted from the American Academy of Child Adolescents Back to Families. Um, if you look on the side of social emotional development, it goes through, and again, we're not going to do this now, this is just background information for you in terms of knowing your audience and working with teens. Basically, what it is that they are feeling, struggling with a sense of identity, feeling awkward about oneself and one's body, worry about being normal, realize that parents aren't perfect, desire for independence, tendency to return to childish behavior, particularly when stress, moodiness, rule and limit testing, that's rad for the younger ones, then it goes through in the, for middle adolescents and late adolescents as well. The one I particularly want to emphasize is tendency to distance self from parents, continue drive for independence, and driven to make friends and greater reliance on them, and popularity can be an important issue. So that is pretty much the population that we're working with. There are people who don't know what they want to be beyond the fact that they don't want to be whatever it is that they were, that they were as children. And this is a general process. This right now has nothing to do with religion and spirituality. That's just who they are and what they're going through. That being said, this obviously impacts their religious development as well. How? How will that same transition, that same growth trajectory, affect how they develop religiously and spiritually? This is not a rhetorical question. This is the participatory portion of the evening. What do you think? Yeah? I agree with him. I agree with him. Interesting. What's your name again? David. So what David points out is they want to be independent from. And one of the things that often happens is that they conflate authority with religion. And they want to be independent from authority. And therefore, they want to be independent from religious rules as well because God as authority gets conflated with parents as authority. Definitely happens for some kids. Yeah. I mean, the whole independent thing is them kind of being themselves. And if you're kind of guiding them, they can be a better themselves. Excellent. So that's already getting to our role as what can we do in order to help them. Again, depending on their parental background, what it is that they're getting away from is going to be fundamentally different. So something that will come across in NCSY are teens who are rebelling from their parents by becoming less from or religious or identified because that's what their home is. And at the same time, we have just as many teens who are becoming more religious because the way they're rebelling against their family is by getting more involved and more engaged, which is also something to be aware of. I saw a couple of other hands floating around over here, or I was losing. <laughs> to be fair, have you smelled these? <laughs> <laughs> like hallucination is a legitimate, legitimate option. <laughs> like, and they're like, no, this is what Canadian Chabotons smell like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, <what's> <laughs> that was the awkward laughter of, how does he know that? <laughs> Um, any other suggestions for how this same process affects their religious development as well? Yes? Julie. I think it also affects that they have this drive to want to become popular and they can make these social friends through Shabbaton. Excellent. So why does someone sign up for a Shabbaton in the first place? For some, it might start as a social thing or turn into a religious thing. Again, I'm gonna, a lot of what I'm saying, by the way, will build up into a point. Some of it's just going to be a throwaway line. This is a throwaway line in advance. Um, one of the things that we tend to get excited about as advisors is, oh my god, they started to do all these religious things. This is amazing. Without necessarily always thinking about why. And is this a natural outgrowth of their development? And when it comes to being a part of a peer group, if in NCSY, we idolize the girl who starts wearing skirts or the guy who starts putting a keep on. It's possible that they start to adapt behaviors that we idolize because, oh my god, this is incredible, because they know that's what's going to get approval from us. And they also know that's going to get approval from their peers without it necessarily being naturally driven and personality driven. And something to think about and sensitivity to have in terms of advisors is how do I ensure 
that whatever behaviors they're taking on is a natural outgrowth of their religious development rather than skipping ahead. Which is why sometimes we actually tell them to okay, just slow down. Take a step or two at the time, because that's something that's actually going to be a long-lasting behavior. Excellent. So, part one, complete. Who, is our, who are our audience? They're teenagers. What are they doing? They're in this transition from dependence on parents into independence. They're defining themselves personally. They're also defining themselves religiously and ideologically and socially and all those other wonderful things. Wonderful. Part two. What the heck are we supposed to do as advisors in order to make it easier? Parents have no clue what they're doing and they wonder, okay, like, send them to the NCSY, great. What is it that, again, I, I've gotten that call from parents, like, how come they listen to you and not to me? Like, because I'm not actually their parent. <laughs> they were, if I were their parent, they would hate me just as much. That's just the way things work. They're trying to disassociate themselves from you and not from me. Therefore, my life is much easier. Um, <laughs> So the question is, what is it that we're supposed to do? What are behaviors that we have or mindsets that we can have? So conveniently enough, if you turn to the second sheet, if I had a fancy PowerPoint, this would be great. <laughs> but instead, we have prints that paper very nicely branded by Shandy on the bottom. So thank you, Shandy, for the branding. And this is different behaviors, which we'll cover, come through in a second, of healthy things to do that can facilitate this development for NC Warriors. But first, I'm going to ask you another potentially awkward question because I got such a wonderful response the first time I just can't help myself. Your first job at Tone as an advisor, first of all, how many here, who here has done NC Swire for let's say more than two years? Okay, anyone here as an advisor, as an advisor? Okay, who here has done NC Swire zero to two years as an advisor? Excellent, okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Your first or second Chabateau. You're an advisor, you're showing up, you don't know a soul there. What's going through your mind? <laughs> no, come on, you can share, Ricky. No, okay. Are you sure? Okay. Well, I'm saying, what's going through your mind? Yeah. My first Chabateau, the only thing I could think was like, Hashem, please don't let me find these kids doing drugs. <laughs> <laughs> no, again, that's literally like. I'm not asking you to describe Sammy. I'm asking you to Sammy. To be someone who's, uh, who they can, um, they can connect with at, their, at simil who's similar to their level, they can connect with who's also going to be a positive role model. Okay, someone who can connect with could also be a positive role model. Were your friends in high school positive role models? Okay, some yes, some no. Some of them might have been. Okay, who else thinks it's important to be their friend? Okay, why? Tell me why. Okay, so what's that distinction between their perspective and our perspective? I'm saying, what? Me, right? I yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking, looking at you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I didn't want to steal from Now I can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Let's have our reset things like, you like want to have to relate to you so that they will, so that you can effectively be a positive influence on them so that they have to see you as a friend at those times. Okay, so right now we're equating, just to be clear, the word friend with being relatable. And I think those are two very different things. We'll get there in a second, yeah. Also, it's important for you, for them to view you as a friend if they're ever going to open up to you and be their, like, they're going to be, they're not going to be their most truest self if they don't feel like you're their friend. If, they're, if you're just another person to them, they're not going to fully open up to you, and unless they fully open up to you, you can't affect them. Uh, I heard a little murmuring of that's not true from this corner. <laughs> I'm saying, so why is that not true? Uh, I would say initially it's not true. I mean, there's, there's as you know, saying, there's a seesaw effect of, you know, love and respect. And, and you definitely need to have both, at least I think you need to have both with, with an NCS wire. But um, you cannot sacrifice the respect because you want them to like you at first. They're, they will respect you. Even if at first you might have to be authoritative by asking them to go into a room or or asking them to not leave a room at a certain point, they they will respect you and then they will confide in you a certain relationship that you will then you know continue to blossom with them as their let's say four years of high school or long. Right. So what Tan's been talking about is what I call the Ava Yira spectrum, and you need both. And. Um, Dr. Kalkman shares a Gemara, I wish you knew where the source is, but I'll look it up afterwards, where they say when it comes to raising children, you're supposed to push away with one hand and pull forward with the other hand. And in so doing, if you have a, it turns in 180 degrees. 
that's what turns them around. And being an advisor is always that balance between how do I serve as a authority figure and also how do I be relatable. And very often at NCSY we jump straight to the relatable because that's what we think allows them to open up. That's what they're connecting with. So I'm going to put that in a box for a second because that's how often we default. The importance of being friends and relatable and there for them when we connect over sports or glee or whatever else. So let's put that aside and move. Or maybe. Or what? Carry on. Or hockey. Um, or literature. Um, to the other side, Yira, respect factor. Beyond the functional running of a Shabbaton, we're going to put that aside also. Why is it important that they respect you? Why is it important that you're more than just one of their friends? How does that change the dynamic? What does it allow you to add? Yeah. Authority. Great. You can be so authoritative if you're just a friendly, friendly relationship. So why is the authority important? I mean, at a very, at a very simple level, you can't have chaos. You need to have some sort of control so that things run smoothly. Okay, I'm saying that's from a functional perspective. What else? Again, we spoke earlier about the teenage development and what it is that they're looking for at this stage in the life. Yeah? Um, if you're ever doing like a breakout session or something, um, a lot of people don't necessarily, they won't necessarily respect somebody their same age. So if you're older than them, you're the authority, then maybe they have something to say. Maybe it's actually legit. Maybe I should listen. Um, it can go from a positive or it can go by a negative depending on the team. Correct. And how do you yeah, actually yeah. respond to that? Yeah. So when you have authority, you have the ability to be a role model as well. Like when you're just their friend, it's like okay, you can kind of sort of impact your friend because that's more peer pressure. When you're an advisor, you have a sense of authority as well as that sense of friendship and you can be their role model. Snaps for you. Um, <laughs> for those who do poetry slams or BBYL, either way. <laughs> no one know BBYL fans? Sorry, they're at the other building. <laughs> they're at the other, the other one? I hear they only got plain pizza there. <laughs> <laughs> they, get they get our leftover donuts. <laughs> Sensing some tension. Um, Okay, so what we discussed was, yes, that when it comes to being an authority, one of the things that teens are looking for, and this is going to sound paradoxical, but it's true, teens love limits. They do. They're going to rebel against them, but teens love limits, they love rules, they love expectations. Why? Because their life is utter chaos. Again, I mean, I've made other jokes people didn't laugh, but I don't make jokes people laugh at them. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. But again, te again, what's going on? They had an identity. They're now trying things out. And they have this dual pull within them for wanting to be safe again, but wanting to try new things. And the question becomes, how do you create an environment where they can experiment in a safe way? And the only way they can do that is if they trust the people who are creating the environment for them that everything's going to be okay here. Think about it for a moment, again, we're not going to have a long discussion because I want to get through some more material and we're running out of time, about why, as a teenager, they're opening up at a kumzitz. That is not one of the normal teenage behavior. Like teenagers, do they share feelings, yes or no? The answer invariably is no. How was your day? Good. <laughs> How was the summer program? Incredible. Tell me about it. It was amazing. What was the best part? It was awesome. <laughs> Should I go? Yeah, best summer ever. Why? <laughs> Look at the photos on Facebook. <laughs> like, like that's the conversation. They're not articulating their feelings. And if you ask them about religion, like, oh, it's like they can't do it either. And what the challenge that we are able to do at NCSY is through being relatable, but also through being an authority, we're able to create a space where they're able to experiment with all aspects of themselves and provide a language for them to describe what it is that they're going through, both emotionally and religiously. Because if they're unable to articulate what it is that they're feeling, and if they're unable to articulate where they are religiously and what they're struggling with, they're unable to think about, okay, where am I and where do I want to go? If you say, oh, what are you religiously? Oh, I'm Orthodox. Okay, what, is that, what does that mean? Oh, I don't, I'm not Jewish. Okay, what, is, what does that mean? I'm not from. What does that mean? Until they actually have a language 
who are talking about it and learning about it, they're not able to actually analyze where they are and then to do something about it. And very quickly, um, just to go through the sheet a little bit, about how do we actually do that? What is the mindset and behaviors we should have as advisors in order to make that happen? Because initially, when we were going over what we should do now, we thought about, okay, like we can talk about what should you do on a bus? And we could talk about, okay, how do you run a lot tailor? What conversations you have in the rooms? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that if you have a mindset going in of this is how I should interact with NCS wires and with teams, and this is what I should think about, no matter what situation you're in, you're going to be able to adapt these behaviors and these mindsets for every situation that you're in. And if we have time, we'll go through one or two of them to show how that's done. So to go to the second bullet, understand the NCU Squire's feelings even if you don't always approve their behavior. Try not to make judgments. Keep the door open on any subject. Be an askable mentor. If they're opening up to you, basically validate. Thank them. Again, and this is something, a line that I use, thank you for trusting me with that. Thank you for giving me the gift of your trust. And actually listen, and don't make judgments. Because a lot of times what teens do, is like when people swim and they like test the water first before jumping in, they share a little bit and they see how you respond. And if you respond well to that, then they'll open up a little bit more and a little bit more until you develop a really deep and meaningful relationship with them. So a lot of times when they ask those initial questions, trying to challenge you or trying to test you, they don't necessarily care what you say as much as how you treat them and respond during that interaction. Which again, so I guess keep going on. Encourage NC Suarez to test new ideas in conversation by not judging their ideas and opinions, but instead by listening and then offering your own views as plainly and honestly as possible. Mutual respect can coexist with differing points of view. This gets to the question of how do you move NCS wires along? It's a question we all ask. How do we move them along? And we all have our own approaches, and then if you ask NCS wires, what's the big problem with advisors? They'll either say they're unrelatable or they're too pushy. It's not forcing things on them. They're like, well, I'm supposed to force things on you. Otherwise, how am I supposed to move you along? Where are we moving to? I have not the foggiest idea, but I'm supposed to move you along. So how do you introduce these ideas? How do you challenge them to go forward? Like, what's, what's the trick? What's the secret sauce? Again, for those of you who have had these conversations, how did you do it? What did you say? What did you do? How did you move someone along? How did you get someone to take on something else? What did you do? Yeah. Sometimes if you make them realize why it's important, you make them realize why it's important to them. So once they understand what's important, then they'll want to progress. Go deeper. What do you mean, make them understand? How does one make someone else understand? I was talking to a kid about like to go to Shiva, and the kid had no interest. So he spoke about it a lot, and he understood. Like, you gotta understand why she was born, why he go to Shiva, and born about it. And then it got him thinking, oh, what should I do? You know, to okay. How did the conversation start? Sorry. I'm saying, how did it start? Uh, you called him up and said, hey, Bob, I want to talk to you about your Shiva? Like, it's not Bob. Is anyone out there? Bob. Just a regular show. Friendly conversation about like, like catching up and then and then what are you doing next year? Oh, that's interesting. Oh cool, I'm idea and and yeah. building from there. Excellent. What else? People have had these conversations, yeah. Um, yeah Sam. Like the, the reward? I'm sorry? Like the reward for doing something? Like, yeah, I don't know, you uh you Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> How do we change behavior? We pay you money. <laughs> I'm saying, you know, and also, again, like, I, 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 I know. No, but again, but it's positive reinforcement. Oh, you, you put a little honey on the cookies and they learn all the things. Um, and halacha, and you're like, I have the binder. Okay, I'm ready for you. Let's go. Page one. When the reality is, is that they just, they want to be heard. They want to be listened to. They don't actually want the answer. They do, like, they want the information, but what's more important to them is the relationship. And then from there, you can segue into the behavior. Because one of the most common misconceptions about mentorship and about change 
is that people change when they feel they're doing something wrong or that they could do something better. Like if only I explain to them why what they're doing is wrong, you are living in a filthy, secular society. <laughs> Don't you see what you're doing? But are you doing? <laughs> and you're like, I'm right. I should wear skirts now. <laughs> How come no one told me this before? But in all seriousness, people change when they feel accepted for who they are. Because only after they feel accepted for who they are, are they able to then reflect on their own behavior and say, okay, I'm happy with who I am, I accept myself. Now, where do I want to go and what do I want to do? And so much of, I think, what we do as advisors is trying to figure out how can we create an environment where the teams accept themselves for who they are, where they accept that religion might be a part of their identity, and then figure out, okay, now where do I go from here? What are they interested in that I can build off of. And I think in order to do that, and with this, I guess we'll close before opening up to questions, is, and I realize this is being on tape, um, I don't believe in Kiru. Shocker. I don't believe in Kiru. I don't believe that I do Kiru. When people call me a Makare, I get very annoyed. Um, I, don't, I don't believe in it. And here's why. This would be very unfortunate. Now is when the tape cut out. Uh, doesn't wait for Kiru. Thanks for playing. Don't turn the tape off. Um, so Kiru, what does the word actually mean? What's the root of the word? Kiru, people don't answer. We had this conversation earlier today. Um, I'm saying Karo. What does the word Karo mean? Close. It means close. Okay, what does the word Makarev mean? To bring closer. Now, how could I possibly have an, object, an, an objection to the word close and to bring closer? What are the assumptions built into the word close? <coughs> that someone's far away. That someone's far away. Excellent. What's the problem with that? that you're closer to them than far away and you're bringing them to where you are. Well, it's true. I'm religious. They're not. They are farther away than God than I am. They're far, far away. That's why we are saving them. Is that not true? Yeah. Uh, you don't have to agree with me. Just because I'm shouting from the front of the room doesn't mean you need to agree with me. And that's how, that's how MC is. That's really why I mean, works. You get in the middle of the circle. Like, it must be true. He said it, but we're in the middle of the circle. I'm saying, push back. Again, I said I have an objection to the word close. Sammy very respectably said, oh, but that makes sense because they're far away and you're close. And that means that there's this distance. And I said, well, they are far away. And Sammy's like, I don't know, you just rebutted my argument, even though I actually agree with you. So what's the problem? <laughs> so like, from a community sense of view, they're farther away from your community. You want to bring them closer to your community. So that's a community sense. But what you're trying to do is give them Judaism, which is something that's an individual, something that's inside of you. It's not something that you take someone else's Judaism. And like, I'm going towards your Judaism. It's like something that's supposed to, it's not supposed to bring them, I don't know. No, you're doing great. That's excellent. I saw another, another couple of hands. We'll let you defend yourself in a second, Sammy. Don't worry. We believe in Shuba. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all about Shuba, which actually means to return. It doesn't mean to repent, but that's a whole different treasure. Um, I'm saying, so yes, that this idea of close and far establishes literally a distance between yourself and the person that you're working with. You're saying, I am better than you. At any time you have that dynamic set up as a student-teacher relationship or a mentor relationship, well, how are they supposed to feel respected if you don't actually respect them? Just because you think you're part of this, just because you're closer than you don't respect them. Okay, good. We're arguing that. You go. A human is an atheist and doesn't believe in God at all, and me, who doesn't believe in God, wouldn't that object and say that I am in some ways closer? Closer to what? Says who? Okay. All right. So I'm saying, but who, who said that believing in God makes you closer to God? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm saying, without getting into a philosophical discussion about atheism, but basically, again, we're having lots of confused spaces on this side. Um, just a pushback. Leora's like. No, I think it's. I'm not thinking in terms of like like distance and closeness. I'm just thinking that like a lot of kids don't realize how important they are and like 
every like the significance of every single Jew and, and what a role each Jew plays. So they may look at an advisor who's wearing skirts or davening with kavana and say like, oh, like he's doing that, like what can I do? But like we have to keep the, the authority and, and keep the respect to also make um, NC Suarez realize that like they have an important job and if they're not doing it, like that's one more Jew not doing what they need to be doing so we can come together as a cop. Correct. So again, so going back, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Miriam. Miriam. So going back to Miriam's point and what Leora was just further emphasizing is we each have our own individual responsibility. We each have our own individual relationship and no one's capable of measuring that besides for God. And in that case, we don't know who's closer or further away. And as a result, we need to respect everyone for where they are and where they're going. I'm not close to something. I have something that I want to share with you that I believe could be valuable to you to integrate in your own life. Great. Now, what's the problem with Mekarev? And uh, Zell touched on this earlier. What's the problem with bringing closer? You're doing it. There we go. They have to be Makar of themselves. That by me saying, I can bring them closer, it's basically removing any autonomous ability they have as an individual. Basically, I'm taking away their power to choose. I'm saying, you're not an actual person who can make decisions. You are someone who I can make do me vote. You are someone who I can make believe. And ultimately, that sort of growth doesn't last because it's not built on anything. It's built on you, and the second you leave, it disappears. So our goal isn't to make them do anything. Well, in that case, what's our goal? What is it that we're doing if we're not making them do anything? Make them want to want themselves. Okay, make them want to want, great. Make them know what their intentions are, know where they're headed. If I use someone that like, works out to be like, Oh, species of people. <laughs> but like now they're not afraid. Now they have a way to ask questions. You know, like, no, it's not like this weird unknown. Excellent. Okay. What else? Make you all do this. What? Make them think. Make them think. Have, what else? Have meaning. Really. Provide meaning. Provide context for them. Great. What else? Possibly answers. Yeah. Excellent. What we're providing for them is information. We're providing for them role models of what life could look like. We're providing for them environments where they're able to immerse themselves in something and try it out the same way that they're trying out other aspects of their life to see, is this something that can fit? And we're giving them the opportunity to try something new. And information and emotions and beliefs such that they're going to be able to continue to do it. And that's really our role as advisors, are to create those environments. And the question that I want to leave you with, we started in a much more awkward place with, okay, where were we in high school? That's where we started, where we were in high school. We very all very happily and very quickly left there. Um, although arguably some of us still think we're in high school, some of us behave we're in high school, some of us wish we were in high school. Um, <laughs> there are some people I wish I knew in high school. Hill always would have questioned one of them. <laughs> although you strike me as the kid like, who just wouldn't have been in high school. <laughs> I walk into class like, hey professor, like, you go here? I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not friends with still on Facebook, you should. <laughs> um, no, you shouldn't. Is this still being um, But what point was I making? Or was I making one of Hillel? The question we left. Ah, yes, the question we were leaving with. Fantastic. This is one of the benefits of being participatory in the hive mind and the wisdom of the crowd. We started with in high school. Then we move through, okay, knowing our audience. Where are the teenagers? What are they experiencing? And we spoke about the role confusion and identity formation. How they knew what they were as children, and now they're making their way into adolescence and figuring things out for themselves, but they don't have a map yet. And as a result, the peer group and validation for who they are becomes even more important. And them trying to figure out and have those guides to help them figure that out 
becomes important because right now they're only friends or parents and they're not talking to their parents because they're rejecting to their parents and the friends don't know what they're doing yet, which means they need, in this case, advisors. They need guides. They need mentors to help figure themselves out, figure out where they are religiously because that's something they're figuring out as well. What does it mean to be a guide or mentor? We spoke about the difference between Ava and Yira, the importance of being liked and being relatable such that they'll feel comfortable opening up to you, but at the same time having the authority and respect such that they know that they can rely on you. They know that you have what to give over to them and that they respect you in the context of an event so that you can create that environment for the rest of them. And that emphasis on reliability, almost half of all mentorship relationships end within three months and nothing's going to happen with that. And the importance of follow-up and everything else. We then spoke about, and you have in front of you, different sorts of behaviors and mindsets you can have as an advisor that will help you build these relationships in a healthy way. And again, you can go through that on your own, but to quickly summarize, of respect, that's where you end up becoming an advisor. That's where you end up becoming an incredibly integral piece of their life. Because your goal isn't to bring them closer. Your goal is to meet them where they are respect them and help them find themselves so that they can connect to Judaism in a way that they wouldn't have been able to previously. And I want to close with one quote that I thought was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I heard it from Dr. Pelkovich, which means it must be true. Um, if you don't know Dr. Pelkovich, you should. He's incredible. Um, it's actually from a book called uh, Palmer, the, the Courage to Teach. If we want to support each other's inner lives, we must remember a simple truth. The human soul does not want to be fixed, and wants simply to be seen and heard. If we want to see and hear a person's soul, there is another truth we must remember. The soul is like a wild animal, tough, resilient, and yet shy. When we go crashing through the woods, shouting for it to come out so we can help it, the soul will stay in hiding. But if we are willing to sit quietly and wait for a while, the soul may show itself. And I thought that quote really sums up what we're trying to do as advisors. That we're there for them waiting. So that when they're ready to open up, when they're ready to talk, they know that we're here for them. And when I look around the room, to end on just a very quick moment of inspiration that I just heard from so many people this weekend, it's not just the faces of advisors that are looking back. That if each of you has those five teens that Zell Newman spoke about, each of you who have grown up in NCSY, I know there are many of you in the room who grew up in NCSY, know the advisors who have impacted your life and already know the people that you've made an impact on. The entire room is filled with those faces. The faces of the people that you've already impacted and the faces of the people that you're going to continue to impact because of the unique way that all of you care and the unique gift that all of you have to give. As opposed to thinking back to where we were in high school, the question I want to leave you with is as an advisor, what is the unique gift that you have to give to the NCS wires? What do you have? Because we all have something different. For some it's going to be more intellectual, for some it's going to be more emotional. Some here are extroverted, some are introverted, some are spiritual, some are intellectual. Each of you has a gift to give, and because each of you are as unique as the NCS wires, each of you can find those NCS wires to connect with. My bracha is that you all find your gift, to give it to as many NCS wires as you possibly can, as we join together to create the strongest Jewish community possible. Thank you. Thank you.